Hello and welcome to Growth Hacks, where we dive into how to scale your business beyond what you thought possible. I'm your host, Ramon Ray, and I'm so happy to be joined by co-hosts Kedma O oh and Lauren Feldman. Kedma, say that better than me. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're so happy to be here today. I'm so happy to be here. So Kedma O, oh, fifth generation entrepreneur, SBA champion, and I became so obsessed with helping small businesses find money that I wrote the book on it. So Target Funding, best-selling author, and just so excited to be here. Awesome. Lauren Feldman, thanks for being here. Tell us again a little bit about yourself and why you're so excited to be here. I am excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've spent the last 20 years covering entrepreneurs and business owners for uh, Forbes, The New York Times, and Inc. Uh, about half a year ago, I went out on my own to start a platform uh, called 21 Hats. We have a daily email newsletter that aggregates all the most important news of the day for business owners and a weekly podcast that has been tracking seven entrepreneurs through the crisis, their ups and downs, of which there have been many. Absolutely. Lauren, well, thanks for being here. Kedma, thanks for being here. Let's dive into the show. You've probably seen them around town and that what you've probably seen are help wanted signs that have been filling the window of many small businesses and large businesses for that matter nationwide. Now, the economy is reopening, as many of you are seeing, but businesses are still struggling to find workers to fill their open positions. That's a problem. The National Federation of Independent Business says over 40 percent, 40 percent of small business owners have reported unfilled job openings. And that's been the story for the past five months and what we want to focus on and talk about today. What's more, many say this lack of workers is actually hurting their ability to keep up with demand. So it's a yin and a yang situation. We want to explore today what's going on. Why can't businesses fill job openings? And should we be concerned that a later labor shortage will last? Plus, what can small business owners do to combat the lack of help and bolster their hiring rates? We'll be diving into this and more on today's show. And to help us break it all down, we have Sophie Wade joining us. She's a work innovation specialist, specialist, author of the book, Embracing Progress, Next Steps for the Future of Work, and founder of Flexcell Network, a future of work consultancy. And you can find her at flexcellnetwork.com. It's my pleasure to welcome the amazing Sophie to the show. Sophie, welcome, and I hope your day is going splendid. It's going very well. Thank you, Ramon. It's lovely to see you again. Awesome. Good to see you too. And thanks for joining me and Lauren and Kedma. So Sophie, let's dive right into it. You're an expert on labor trends and more and where the labor market is headed today and in the future. How are you seeing, Sophie, help us uh, level set this, how the pandemic is affecting the labor market? What is fueling this perceived or actuality for many labor shortage? Sophie, do tell us. Well, you know, the pandemic really threw quite a challenging, a uh, cha lot of changes that were going on in the labor market um, and really sort of threw that into tumult because the future of work, which was coming, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we weren't, we were sort of resisting it and worried about it and daunted by it. But then it, it was accelerated by the, by the pandemic and all the digitization that, that, came on, that, that came with it. And that has really changed what we're looking at. And as the, we sort of emerge from the pandemic, everything that sort of was the underlying business conditions are the future of work. And what that has meant is we have a very different focus on talent. And that talent and, and how, the, how our workers, how we ourselves are looking at work and thinking about and perceiving it. And basically the social contract has really changed. So what does that mean for, for, for us and how we're thinking about work? There's a, there was a, a very interesting article on Business Insider which said, people are epiphany quitting. Mm. So people are sort of thinking about how they're going to to interact with um, the labor market, how they're going to to spend their time and what they're going to do. And then there are new rules being being sort of written now, being drafted. And that's what's really changed. There's so much turbulence that's but the sort of affecting all the different businesses on all sides. And, and I think there's the, the, you know, as people are sort of coming in and looking at you know, what does work mean to them? What does, uh, you know, what, what what lifestyle do they want to have? Where do they want to live? All of those those changes are uh, affecting how, where people want to work and which businesses they want to work for, big or yeah. small. Mm. And that's a powerful thing for sure. I think two things come to mind for me, Sophie. One is definitely the employees. I think they have the issues they're dealing with in the labor market and et cetera. Next question to follow up on that, Sophie, what's your advice, your input, your guidance for the employers? There's been a lot of culture and social shifts, social shifts that have been happening just in the past, what, little over a year with so many things that have gone on in the political world, in the business world, and et cetera. How does that impact employers? What should we be looking at today 
And if you can kind of project a bit forward, what should we maybe be looking at the next three to six months, Sophie? I think there's some very, very interesting dynamics going on in terms of thinking about the, the overall talent pool. And this happened in 2008. There were a lot of people who were thrown into temporary employment mm. um, um, involuntarily. And then they started to change how they were looking at the kind of lifestyle they were living. And that's happened in, in, a, in a much more, uh, you know, on a much grander scale this time. And so as people sort of rethinking um, how they want to work and what kind of uh, what those parameters are, the employers can also be thinking that. And it has been changing in terms of what that extended talent pool looks like. And there are companies that are, are crafting jobs around the uh, specific people rather than putting trying to put people into sort of job boxes, which they don't necessarily fit. So crafting jobs around a specific person and then that and then sort of thinking about non-employees with specific skills and specialized skills who can fill in the gaps. And that's another thing that small businesses can take advantage of because they can sort of look at who they have as employees, where, where their business is going, because it may have changed, customer, customer behaviors have changed, and wh who, who they need in what places and how they can fill in as the market is developing, our businesses are changing, the, it's much, much, much less predictable still. And so we don't necessarily know where we need to hire someone because it might change from month to month or, you know, six months down the line. So really thinking about employees and non-employees and just having a different sort of mindset in terms of what, how, how you're thinking about talent and how you're engaging them um, and really sort of bringing them on board in a different way. Yeah, Lauren, you see, thank you, Sophie. Lauren, you talk to small businesses every week and all the time. Are you echoing this? Are you seeing something different that this is definitely no longer the employer market? I think I'm saying that right. Of even 10 years ago or 20 years ago, right? We used to talk about this. This is not our father's or mother's revolution, as it were. Things are now changed so much. What are you seeing, Lauren? And what can we learn from what your expertise is on this? Oh, I think Sophie's exactly right. Uh, it, there's a big mismatch out there, but it, it does vary greatly by industry. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's really difficult in some, uh, I mean, restaurant uh, people right now are really struggling. There are others where it's it's difficult, but but not catastrophic. And I think the important thing is wh wherever you fall on that spectrum, you have to look for opportunities. You have to think about what you can do. And it may mean you have to change your business model. You may have to pay people more than you're used to paying them. You may have to uh, change the way you sell your goods or services. Things, you know, things may have to change. Yeah, and I think for sure they're going to have to change. For sure, we're all seeing that for sure. Sophie, I want to touch on another point that's real important. And again, in Growth Hacks, we want to give those high-level snippets of information to the audience listening, this brand new show that they can use to go home, practical tips, and see the future and help to grow their business. Uh, one thing I know that employees are going on and employers are talking about is the aspect of higher wages or not. So you have higher wages or, or the wage shift, Sophie, combined with remote work, combined mm -hmm. with enhanced benefits. It's like a, a soup. I don't know if it's a soup of opportunity or a soup of confusion or a soup of angst. <laughs> but uh, it, I'll word it this way, Sophie. Many small businesses are, are worried, or maybe they should be, about competing with some larger businesses. What, what is your best practice? What is your advice to us? Is this worry unfounded? Or should there be concern with competing with larger companies? I think, look, I, I think it's it, dealing with this much turmoil is challenging, you know, period. However, there are lots of things that smaller businesses can do, which larger businesses can be uh, sort of, um, you know, have their hands a little bit mm -hmm. tied. The business, small businesses can be much more flexible. And there are lots of things that employees now, as they're thinking, like, how do I want to work? How do I want to live? Um, giving them flexibility, not just, you know, it could be location, it could be also be hours and, and really sort of working because those are the, working with them to sort of find the right combination um, and, and sort of uh, working with them to find the different combinations with all the different configurations of the teams that they may, may have, because that doesn't necessarily cost any money. It's really a question of mindset and approach and, and having a different, uh, uh, more reciprocal arrangement with, with employees. And that can really create the environment that em that employee actually is really, um, you know, you know that, that's, the, what, that's what they really want. They, they, as long as they can feel connected with their employer, that actually gives, can give them more feeling of security than working for a big organization because it's really much more of a sort of trust. It's, it's to do with the connection and alignment of values. And, and, and helping them work in the ways that they want to and, and aligning them with their skills and strengths. They're doing stuff that they want to do. It may be, you know, really highlighting the purpose and the mission and connecting people. People 
you know, enjoy their work when they feel that what they're doing matters and they understand what their con contribution and that's much easier what the contribution actually brings. And that's much easier to, to, to make that connection in a smaller business. I love it. Uh, Kim, I'm curious from yourself, uh, what you're seeing is, is the, is the small business owner seeing the larger business as a competitive threat? Is that kind of zeroed out? Has COVID leveled the playing field for everybody? Kind of like in the movies, nobody has electricity, nobody has gas, we're all the same, or is it still something that should be concerned? And feel free to reword that a different way, but what mm -hmm. are you saying with this competitive uh, dimension? Ramon, excellent question. I would say because the landscape has changed, because the rules have changed, everyone's in the same boat trying to figure it out. And I'm gonna agree 100% we're not about changing the business model. We have to change the mindset model. Mm. This is no longer, I want to hire Lauren as my senior VP social media manager. I want to hire Lauren and understand, Lauren, does he have a family? Who is in mm. his family? What is he interested in achieving? So, you know, these help signs where it says we need help, it's got to change. We need your help or we can help you get where you want to go. It's no longer we need, it's what can you do for me to get where I want to go? And in doing so, you're going to get to where you want to go. So the entire mindset has to change or else you are going to be in a situation where people do not want to work with you. Yeah, and I know that's not new news, Sophie, but to riff off of what Kevin just said, are you seeing that shift getting bigger that it's no longer just come to me, we'll pay you a salary, you need me, and it's more two ways like, okay, what can we do to keep you? Are you is that yeah. happening, Sophie? Oh, absolutely. So so what's sort of generally called the social contract, which is kind of like the connection, the 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 balance, the equation between mm. the corporation and the employee, that's sort of been broken. And so employees have had no financial security, no job security. Um, you know, basically, you know, all the pension funds are underfunded. I mean, it's it's a bad situation. It's not a great situation to be as an employee. And and you know, there's been this growing realization. You see that with the younger generations, kind of like, you know, you guys have retirement, what about us? So with that shift, it's more of a connection. And as, exactly as Kedma says, why would I go and work for an organization if you're not going to help me build my skills? Because that's what I need to, to have financial security. That's what I need to be successful in the future. And I will, I will bring all my skills if you help me develop them. And I will you know, channel them in your direction and help your business. But we're, we're in this together. And there's much more understanding of that, particularly with the younger generations. And that's where a lot of the anxiety comes from, particularly with Gen Z. But so, so really bring that connection, understanding that this is a mutually beneficial arrangement and, and with a, a much more powerful, and I think you know, overall, a much more positive um, re relationship um, between employers and employees going forward. That's what, that's what we, that's the positive positive um, outcome that we can create. It sounds like the relationship between me and my 23 year old daughter, for sure. Anyways, um, we'll, we'll have another show for that another day. Um, <laughs> Sophia, supply chain is really, really important to Oracle NetSuite customers. These are companies, many of them have supply chain uh, uh, products and services, shifting things globally. Can you touch on that a bit? How the, the uh, new way of work and et cetera might be affecting supply chains? Is there anything that these growing businesses can do to mitigate this? Any advice on that? It's challenging. I mean, we had, uh, you know, the ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. We've seen, you know, all, all different challenges with the supply chain. And I think one of the, some of the things that I've seen really help is value um, companies that are connected along the value along the supply chain who have similar values because we're so much more integrated along the supply chain that the more that we can actually be working together in, in sort of stronger partnerships and I see software companies you know working with their clients and, and shifting what's what's on their R and D slate in order to help their clients more so I think you know being working more as partners working on a more integrated basis I think also what we've been seeing with the pandemic in terms of more digitization is that there, when this it is accelerating if the, if you don't have labor in certain areas you're just going to have to do some automation so that this this is really another another step in accelerating um or, or digitization and automation and and you know and some of that's beneficial because it really is putting putting human beings to to focus on the things that we're really good at and you know non-sequential thought and inspiration um and and sort of moving us away from some of the really dreary tasks but it's happening much faster than we you know we had anticipated so the 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 need for upskilling the numbers at edX um went through the roof i think from 20 to, from 2019 it went from 60 million to um 
people who enrolled to 110 million. So the huge um, increase in number of people who enrolled in courses because people are needing to upskill in all kinds of areas. So, so that's one focus. And that's something that also the small businesses can offer their um, employees in terms of, of sort of bringing them on board. I'm going to help you with your skills. There are lots mm-hmm. of MOOCs, ma- um, massive open online courses mm-hmm. um, that can really help people upskill, which helps the business, which helps employee. And that helps along the supply chain, you know, trying to fill in in, in some of the gaps um, as well as digitize, you know, automating some of the them bringing in new platforms. Awesome. As we close up the session, Sophie, I want to ask Lauren and Kedma a political question. I love to put people in uncomfortable situations. So the political question, Kedma, for you is remote work. Is everybody going to go remote work? We're all going to be working at home from some tablet or are we coming back to the office or something else, Kedma? Short answer, like yes or no, or really, I want you to predict it. <laughs> I want to say it depends, right? right. I never thought in a million years that I would be checking in on Zoom for my doctor on a pain that I'm having on my leg. And I'm like, this is kind of very strange, but okay, I'm going with it. So I think, I think supply and demand. And I think if, if industries try it and it doesn't work, they're going to have to go back to the old way. But I'm going to say the old way is now up for grabs and people are asking for something different. Lauren, what say ye? Are we going to be on headphones and online calls for the next 20 years or eventually is Lauren going back to some brick building? Well, not you, not me, but, you know, our people. We're never going back. Uh, there, are, there are changes. You know, we've learned things that we're, I mean, speaking for myself, I'm so happy to have learned. There are things that I can do now that I wouldn't have dreamed of trying to do before. And just think about, you know, somebody in sales who used to have to get on a plane and fly around the world to try to make a sale to, you know, today they can set up two zoom calls and try to sell people on opposite sides of the earth and, and be home for dinner. Uh, who, who wants to go back to the old way? Absolutely. Sophie, we'll end with you. What's the future of work look like? I know it's a big billion dollar question, but I'm sure you've been asked it a billion times. What do you want to leave us with as we close this segment out? Um, it's unpredictable, it's changing, it's going to be a lot of evolution, we're going to get used to constant change, we are already, we have been sort of, uh, got, we've got more accustomed to that during the pandemic, so it's going to be less extreme than, than that, but it's going to continue evolving, and, and we're going to be, we're going to be ready for it, I mean, a lot of this flexibility and how we're working and remote and all that kind of thing, that's because we need to be, we need to have that open mindset, we need to be thinking in different ways, because that's what the future holds, so, you know, with it, we've, we've had some practice and we're ready for it now. I love it. And Sophie Wade, one more time, give us your website link, please. Flexcellnetwork.com. I also have a podcast, Transforming Work with Sophie Wade. Hope you come awesome. listen. Nice. Awesome. So if you want to hear the information or just hear Sophie's lovely voice, check her out. <laughs> Sophie Wade, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate you. All right. Wow. Kedma and Lauren, that was amazing. That was a fast dose of information, but that's what Growth Hacks is all about. A recap for us, Lauren, as best you can. What's one thing you may have heard in our discussion today that you think we need to take home, write down, and keep in mind? Can I give you one thing we didn't hear? Yes. (laughs) I would like to emphasize that business owners have to be ready to raise their prices. I think Mm. they're way too reluctant to do that. And you know, boy, if ever there was a time when people are ready for you to raise your prices, this is it. But I talk to business business owners all the time who are afraid and they 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 hesitate. And it's it's just a it's a big mistake in normal times. It's a huge mistake right now. I talked to a business owner yesterday who's having supply chain problems, mm-hmm. can't get product. She sat down with some spreadsheets, figured out what she would have to raise her price to, to stretch out her supply for the next three months until she gets the next order. And she figured out she could raise her prices, I think like 20%. She redid it and things started selling immediately. Um, so, you know, I think it doesn't work for everybody. No, one size fits all, sure. you know, is not the rule, but everybody should consider it. And I like what you said, Lauren, this is the opportunity to do that. What time more than now, not to take advantage away, but people will understand it. Uh, Kedma, what, what is one thing you learned or advice you want to give in this segment that we had and talk to Sophie Wade? Absolutely. The, the, the Really, the takeaway is to realize we're in a relationship, a social contract. And we're talking about pouring in education into all of our employees. We have to be pouring into in education into ourselves. Mm. Those leaders need to get to a mastermind or connect with Ramon and Lauren and learn about reshifting how they lead. Because I walk into companies all the time where my job is to help the company avoid going out of business. Nine times out of 10, one of the biggest issues 
is lack of trust, culture misunderstanding, and confusion on the vision or mission. That has nothing to do with money. Mm. That has everything to do with leadership. So wow. social contract and get yourself to a training. I love it. Go <laughs> preach. Go <laughs> preach, Kendra. I love it. I love it. Listen, we're going to move to segment three of Oracle NetSuite's Growth Hacks. And I get to interview the uh, CEO and co-founder of Beeline. And that is Jess Kennedy. Jess, thanks for joining us today, being with us. This is going to be a fun discussion for sure. All about we had first an expert on the future of work and these things. Today, we get to talk to a business owner that's going through some of these challenges. Jess, it's good to have you here. Please do tell us a bit about yourself and about Beeline. Yeah, thank you. So I've been in the mortgage services industry, dealing with real estate over a decade on the legal side as well. Uh, we, me and my co-founder started Beeline May of 2020, uh, just as the pandemic was taking off and we are a digital mortgage platform. Okay, stop, and, stop, stop, uh, just, just, stop, 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 yes, yes. You said you started it as the pandemic was taking off. Can you just pause there one minute, let Kedma and I give you a, an air round of applause. I mean, that's like baller stuff. So, you know, <laughs> continue please. I'm sorry to so rudely interrupt, but I had to, go I, ahead. I, I would say it was not intentional. Uh, we had hoped okay. to have be launched much faster than that, but hey, you roll with what you got. And so we did. And uh, we just think it's a it's actually a great time for people who really didn't want to have to go into, you know, brick and mortar and meet with a loan officer face to face when people weren't feeling particularly safe about that. So it felt, you know, it filled a need that we didn't know was going to be there. But uh, we do think people want to have that easier financial product that uh, they don't currently have in the mortgage side. We have it kind of another mortgage or other financial services products, but not really in mortgage. And we're hoping to fill that gap for people. Yeah, and I want to get into the hiring aspect, but I do want to ask one follow-up question. Is what you're doing hard to do? It's more rhetorical because I assume it is, but when I heard the word mortgage and houses and real estate, I'm already getting a headache. I don't know about Lauren and Kedma, but I'm already getting dizzy. So <laughs> is this hard to do what you've done and are trying to do and doing? Well, hopefully it's just hard for us. We're trying that's to make I mean. it easy for, car for customers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's the point, right? We do all the heavy lifting. We figure out how to marry technology with that great human touch and great customer service. Um, and hopefully come out with a really simple, uh, headache-free mortgage for the average person, right? That That's the goal. And so we're using this layering of AI and, like I said, that great customer experience and shortening timeframes for people, things that take days only will take, you know, minutes or hours. And then, you know, a, a process that takes months, especially right now with the interest rates having been where they've been, could take 60, 90 days you know, now only takes 14 to 25 days. And so we're looking to just create a simpler path for people. Um, and people want that certainty. In this very uncertain world, that's what people are looking for. Sure. My follow-up question to that, and then I would definitely want to invite Kedman and Lauren, feel free to pepper Jess with some questions if you wish, is that my follow-up question to that, talk about your journey of uh, different ways of recruiting talent. In the previous segment, we talked about how for many smaller companies and larger companies, this whole issue of recruitment is a challenge. This is not just on the headlines, but many of us are experiencing this. What have you gone through and what's kind of the solution? Or what have you done different? Teach us in Beeline. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so coming out in the pandemic meant we've done all of our hiring uh, since the pandemic. I think there were seven of us pre-pandemic times. Now we have 89. Wow. So we, yeah, so we've, we've done it all in this environment. And it's had its challenges. You know, it's been challenging to get the culture fit down and really understand what that looks like for us. I mean, boys that were, you know, trying to, or the candidates were trying to recruit online and these types of, you know, video interactions. Mm -hmm. We've also shortened the cycle time quite a bit uh, because you can have multiple people interview at one time uh, from our side with a with a potential person that we want to hire. Uh, so those have all been, you know, challenges, but also good things. You know, we've cut down recruitment times and we've been able to hire across the U.S. instead of focused on just these, you know, operation centers that we have on the East Coast. So, you know, we've seen some some real pros and cons out of this environment. Um, I think that we'll continue to be happy that we can have people come in for interviews as much as possible for certain roles, especially those that are touching, you know, our, our customers in some way. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a time, you know, listening to the segment earlier, it's a time of learning uh, for us and what we'll keep and kind of what we won't keep. And we'll probably keep this video interaction as sort of our initial phase of recruitment uh, where we do like an initial video interview. 
And then if possible, if someone is local to an operation center, we'll bring them in for an in-person and try to do more of a culture test at that point. Got it. Before I invite Lauren to ask you a follow-up question here, I'm curious, uh, Jess, I'm going to put you in the spot here. From what you've heard so far, would you hire me for Beeline? Could I qualify as a customer service rep? <laughs> or would you be like, nah, he's not a fit. Don't answer that. It's okay. You Lauren, <laughs> go ahead, Jess, <laughs> if you wish. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> Lauren, please. Looking for a question. new job already, Ramon, huh? Yes, indeed. <laughs> we just got started here. <laughs> Jess, I'm curious, what have you learned about interviewing over Zoom? Do you, uh, did you figure out any tips about how you really get to know someone and how you assess that cultural fit when you're not in the same room? Yeah, it's funny. It's so simple because one of the first things that kind of would send a flag to me is, does the person put their camera on? It's so simple. But are they interested in us really knowing them? Are they interested in really knowing us? Are they interested in having as much of a connection as they can form in, an, in a you know video interview process? And it tells you sort of their level of engagement sometimes. So that it's so simple, but just what I've noticed is the people that were so excited to be on video tend to be some of our most excited and engaged employees as well. I love that hack because I think you're right. The simple things, and I'm sure Kedman and Lauren may have done it. Sometimes I do simple things like not reply. If the person's really hungry and wants it, they'll follow up. But Kedma, what else do we want to know from Jess? Any follow-up questions? Well, I'm just going to put an invite to disagree on one comment, and I'm going to be sensitive because I have three passports, and I've lived all over, mostly in a lot of countries. And there are some cultures, especially in Asia, where the mm -hmm. idea of putting something on video would just not be comfortable. And so one yes. of the things we have to be sensitive to when we are working outside of the US is what is the culture sensitivity and comfort level for those cultures? Mm -hmm. And not to negate that maybe they are not comfortable with video and we can try a different aspect or we can wait for a second or third interview to move into that step. So I just wanna call yeah. that out. I love what Jess is doing. What I heard was you're giving me peace, convenience and time mm -hmm. management. You just happen to do it in the mortgage space. So um, I love that. And one last thing I would say is um, in terms of just recruiting, I think it's, Every single day, I would say it's about making sure that whoever is coming on board feels like they're going to be special. Mm. Yeah. Feels like they're going to be special. And honestly, Ramon, we have no issue as a company to spend thousands of dollars for a 30 second commercial to talk about product and services. But we don't think about that when we're trying to recruit. Mm. That's true. That's true. Jess, yeah. what can we learn from you uh, as we as we continue on here about remote hiring? There's many companies here listening to the Oracle NetSuite Growth Hacks show that are in the same boat you've done. So can you give us one yeah. or two more tips or insights of people who are hiring remotely? I can't see the person, can't shake their hand, can't do the typical thing. Let me drive in your car. We've heard that before. I can't take them to a restaurant. <laughs> what do I do? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we are big on trying to connect with people on that personal level. And sort of what Kedma was talking about with you know, the employee wants to know how what they're going to be a part of at Beeline is enhancing them. And so what we're really big on is giving them the vision for the company and how that vision for the company is inclusive of them and what that means for them, their family trajectory, their financial success. You know, like you said, they're upskilling, you know, things that they never would have done before. And for us at Beeline, that's, that's maybe a little bit easier than other places because we're trying to enter in as a disruptor into this environment, into mortgage, where we are doing things differently and people can see that as an opportunity for themselves. Like, hey, I can be part of this company that's trying to do it better than the bigger players in the space that don't use technology. And how does that, you know, how will that impact me years mm -hmm. to come? And we have this really big vision that they can be a part of. And so getting into the vision pieces with them for us is really big to understand their level of engagement and hey, is that something they're interested in? As a startup, that's not for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So we can easily see sometimes like, hey, maybe that's not the path for this person. They, they really love structure. They really love knowing what that job will be. They love knowing what their hours will be. Some people, that's where, that's, that's where they thrive, right? And so I don't want to put a square peg into a round hole. So I'm pretty open and honest about that in my interview process with them. Um, and so I think that's really important to get out in a video interview instead of waiting for the person to come sit in the seat and find out these things the hard way. Um, and then it's just not a good fit for them or for us. So uh, it's making sure you don't let the video interview be non-transparent because you feel like you have to wait for them to be in person with you or to be in the seat to share certain details. 
And I think it can be easy to short, sort of not share as much via an interview video process. But sure. but we kind of take the opposite approaches where maybe we're uh, very, very transparent during the interview process. One final question I have for you, uh, Jess, and again, it's so good to have you here today. Have you made any mistakes? Has there been anything in the 90 people you've oh, yeah. hired, and I don't need to know their name or address or social security number, <laughs> but uh, anybody that you can think of, you know, you know, R George or Margaret or <laughs> Ramon, I'm getting in the hot water here. Forget the name. The point is, Jess, have you made any mistakes where you're like, you know, Ramon, we hired these five people, 10 people, 20 people, or this two yeah. people. Here's what we did wrong, and we should we, we, we short-circuited maybe, or we, we know we should have done these 10 steps. We did nine. Anything like yeah. that's happened to you? Yeah, definitely. Um, for sure, because of the virtual environment that we're interviewing in, we, especially in the earliest days, we were finding it hard to really understand the actual skills of mm. the people that we were hiring. And being in an industry like ours, you have to know a lot of really specific and rather technical things. And so not being able to evaluate that as easily um, and being so new, we didn't have these evaluation methods early on, and we're relying on more ad hoc questions during interviews. I would say that that was how we made, uh, you know, our earliest mistakes in our recruitment mm. efforts. Awesome, Jess Kennedy, COO and co-founder of. Remote, can I ask the question? Yes, hold on. You know, oh. let me let me reverse that. Brrr, go backwards. <laughs> Lauren Feldman, I was going to ask. Do you have a question? <laughs> I'm dying to know something. I've been through the mortgage process quite a few times. It's a yep. nightmare. I can only compare it to to a colonoscopy. I've been through that too. Um, I want to know, what are you doing differently? It, it, how can you make it so easy? Or is it that you have so much money that you don't care if people pay the loans back or not? Well, it's not the latter. Okay. Um, so let's, let's, let's not start there. No, I mean, you know, we, like you guys, start as consumers. And being consumers in this space and having to get loans as, you know, Jeff Kennedy homeowner, uh, like you said, you're you're sort of giving up a lot of information. You're, you know, committing your firstborn child to the process, and it's long and it's uncertain and it just globally stinks. And so we just figured there has to be a better way to do this, and there does. And like I said, the the mortgage industry is the slowest to adopt technology of any industry that I've seen. And it's funny because every mortgage services uh, component around it is actually quite good at integrating technology into their process. And this behemoth industry is like the last to kind of get there and to, to gain that same adoption. So it's, it's not easy to do, but once you put your mind to saying we're going to apply technology in a smart way, not saying we're going to replace all the humans, that's not the goal. It's to marry like everyone else has done in other industries, marry the human component with the technology so that it's more seamless. You're not having 10,000 people at the mortgage company ask you the same 500 questions as the consumer. Yeah. Like you already explained yourself. You don't need to explain yourself again. Um, and there's so simple technologies and simple processes to make that happen that just haven't been thought of before because, well, it's hard to move very big ships very quickly. And we've been a very small ship and we can move a little bit faster. And I'm really proud of where we've gone with that in our technology. You should be. I love it. Jess Kennedy, thank you so much. CEO and co-founder of V-Line. Thanks for being with us today on the thank Oracle you. NetSuite Grow Hacks, Grow, Growth Hacks show. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Kedma and Lauren, what an amazing segment that was. I know that uh, Kedma, I'll turn to you. One thing I heard was the aspect of, again, I think it's a theme that we've talked about, is that we can look at things as not as an opportunity, as a negativity, or we can see things as an opportunity. So this remote hiring and video hiring, there's a lot of negativ negativity to it. But I think if done well, there can be opportunities. What's a takeaway that you had, a growth hack that we can take away from you, Kedma, from what you've heard? Well, first of all, I want to take away that, you know, sometimes the best time to start a company is right after a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the reality is, is that's where people are fresh and new and like, oh, I want new things, new ideas. You know, they're open to change. So great on Jess for taking that initiative. And second to that, what I really love about this is taking something like videos and making it work. Sure, you know, with 90 uh, situations, there's going to be situations that are not comfortable. There may be um, pivots we have to do with like introverts who mm. don't really like to be on video. Sometimes I have to train those introverts to say, it's okay, it's okay. You know, it's very, it's, it may be very stressful for them. But what I love is um, that she found a way to make it work and it's working and it's working. And that's what I want to leave the audience with is 
don't be afraid of trying something because you think it won't work. Mm. Try it. And then you can make a decision whether you want to continue or whether you have to pivot. I love it. Try it, try it, try it in. Fail fast, you know, and move exactly. on. Lauren, what did you learn? What can we, what's a nugget, a growth hack we can take from you today? You know, I liked what she said, what Jess said about the fact that she was able to try certain things because they're a small ship and her competitors are big ships who have a tough time turning around. Uh, I think that's true for all kinds of the businesses. And oftentimes smaller businesses don't realize the advantages they have over their larger competitors. And, and that's particularly true when it comes to hiring. I think you can extend an opportunity to somebody to be part of a mission, to be, you know, have a front seat right there where decisions are being made, uh, to really be part of something. And that's so important right now, because if there's anything we've learned through this uh, labor shortage period, it's that, People are looking for meaning. They want something to care about. And small businesses are better situated uh, than anyone to, to offer that. Absolutely. Listen, Lauren and Kevin, this has been fantastic. And I want to encourage the Oracle NetSuite Growth Hacks audience. If you have questions, you have comments, you have thoughts, please use the comments function below or over there, up there, there, and talk to Kedma, talk to Lauren, talk to myself. We are here to help answer your questions. Our guests are here to answer your questions and to help you grow your business. Before we go to the next segment, Kedma O at KedmaO.com and TargetFunding.com. Lauren Feldman, founder of 21 Hats Podcast at 21hats.com. Thanks for joining me. Appreciate you both for giving your time on this segment. Thank you. As we go to the next segment, just to remind you all again, we want to hear from you for sure. And now our final segment of the show, we want to talk about some top stories that may interest you. They could be fun and they could help your business. One number one, unicorns are taking over. A new report from CB Insights shows that 136 new startups achieved a billion dollar valuation last quarter. That's big money and that's good news. The number of unicorns grew 491% over last year. Top story number two. And the Labor Department says the consumer price index increased by, wait for it, 5.4% in June. This is the highest 12-month increase since August 2008, with high prices for used cars and trucks accounting for more than a third of the index range. Maybe they got me in that index somewhere, too. And top story number three, and throwing back to the 90s is priceless, unless you're an unopened copy of Nintendo Super Mario 64, which just sold for, wait for it, $1.56 million at an auction in Dallas, the highest price ever paid for a single video game. That's our top stories on Oracle NetSuite's Growth Hacks. We're so glad to have you with us today. And that does it for us here on this Growth Hacks episode. But wait for it. Join us next time where we continue to dive into how to scale your business. We'll be back on Thursday, August the 5th. Again, that's Thursday, August the 5th at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. I will see you next time. Thanks so much for watching.